As we've seen, trench warfare made World War I a stalemate pretty quickly, meaning neither side could gain a strategic advantage to win the war eventually. So today we're going to look at how Germany tried to break the stalemate and how the war ended and why it ended the way it did. Questions for today include, how do you win a war of attrition if you can't make any decisive victories? What can you do to gain an advantage? And then start thinking about how each state's point of view can determine what they think about how the war ended and why. Um, when wars end, normally there are treaties and the winners get something out of the losers. How might this war make that extra complicated? How do you win a total war? The chain of events that led to the end of World War I can be complicated, and it's much simpler if you think about it in terms of this central question. How do you break the stalemate? The short answer has to do with the Russian Revolution and America's entry into the war. So here's the overview. World War I was, as we've seen, a war of attrition. Because each side was relatively evenly matched and neither side could gain an advantage, the only way to win was to wear down the other side's ability to keep going, to keep producing soldiers for the front, to keep producing weapons for those soldiers, and to keep getting food for everybody, both the soldiers in the front and people at home. You could also win by wearing down the opponent's morale. If the people at home don't support the war anymore, it might be really difficult to keep it going. And this generally was the strategy that led to the end of the war. The first thing that happened is that Germany devised a plan to get Russia to stop first. And remember, Germany is in the middle here trying to fight in the east against Russia and in the west against France and Britain, technically with Austria-Hungary, but they're really not much help. So Germany successfully gets Russia out but then also missteps and provokes the United States entry into the war on the Allied side. When the United States joins the war, they bring with them a ton of resources and a ton of fresh troops that haven't seen battle yet after everybody else has been fighting for three years. And this in the end proves to be too much. Germany basically gets exhausted first and asks for an armistice. There's no decisive battle that is won. There's no parade through the capital city of the defeated side like there traditionally would be during wars. It's just one side, Germany, saw the writing on the wall first and quit. Part of the reason they quit was because when the United States joined the war, um, Woodrow Wilson got to opine on the war aims. And American President Woodrow Wilson talked a lot about his 14 points, about the point of the war being for self-determination for nations, which is not anything that any of the other warring states thought at all. Um, France and Britain had different concerns, but Germany thought that this 14 points thing might be its ticket to exiting the war without being punished for it because self-determination would mean all the German-speaking people get to stay in one state. And in theory, if Germany became a republic, which it did, um, then maybe it would be treated nicely. It was wrong. So let's look at these steps in a little more detail. Idea number one to break the stalemate involved getting Russia to quit first, freeing up the Eastern Front. During the war, it was a struggle for all belligerent states, but probably more for Russia than for everybody else because Russia was not an industrialized power. Russia struggled to produce enough food and weapons to support the war effort. And it was led by Nicholas II, who was just, you know, not a very bright man and had no idea that he made bad decisions. So during the war, there was famine, which means hunger, starvation. There were riots. The Russian army was not equipped for the war. And after millions of soldiers and civilians had died, by 1917, Russia was already on the brink of collapse. Germany has this like secret plan and it's kind of brilliant, mostly because it's amazing that it worked. But 
Um, there was this guy named Lenin, who was Russian, who had gotten kicked out of Russia for revolutionary activities, and he was a communist, and he was hiding out in Austria-Hungary at the time. Germany thought, let's send him back to Russia in secret, see if he can provoke a revolution. If that happens, Russia will have to quit, and then we can concentrate all of our forces west. And essentially, that's the short version of what happened. We'll get to the longer version when we study the Russian Revolution. But Lenin is secreted back into Russia in a sealed train car. Um, a revolution had happened before, like months before, that installed a provisional government. But that provisional government wanted to continue the war. And so a second revolution happened, led by Lenin and the Bolsheviks, the Communist Party, that successfully and here I'm summarizing a lot, but whatever, um, successfully turned Russia into the world's first communist state, the Soviet Union. Um, the Tsar and his whole family were shot. And, you know, years later, Disney made Anastasia. Maybe you've seen it. So um, Russia, now communist, now the Soviet Union, does quit the war because communists believe that this war is an imperialist capitalist venture and blah, 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 and because they're losing. Um, and Germany gets what it wants. This is great for Germany and it's terrible for the Allies for a few reasons. Number one, now Germany can focus all of its strength west and that's not good for France or Britain. Number two, um, now there's a communist state and communism is something that threatens the ruling class of all of these other Western states. So that's like double bad news. So it seems like Germany might have the advantage and then it makes a huge misstep. Another thing about war is that it requires a lot of production in terms of weapons. And each belligerent state wasn't necessarily making all of their own. The United States was making a ton of money throughout the war, supplying the Allies with weapons and materials and loans needed to wage the war without actually joining in itself. So the US remained neutral until 1917. But it was giving the Allies an advantage, and the Germans wanted to cut off that advantage to break the stalemate, right? Um, this idea is going to backfire. So again, this is the incredibly short version of events. But two things happened. One, a German submarine hit and sank a ship called the Lusitania that had a few American civilians on it, and that was bad. But then also, Germany wanted to see if it could rope Mexico into joining the war on its side, proposing to restore the lost territory to Mexico that Mexico had lost to the United States in the Southwest if Mexico joined on the side of the Central Powers. Um, this proposition was made via telegram called the Zimmerman Telegram, kind of famous. Um, the United States intercepted that telegram and then between those two events, that was enough to declare war on Germany. So 1917, already three years into the war, the United States mobilized troops um, late, but still, and helped a ton in making it possible for the Allies economically to sustain war, and also helped by blocking off trade with Germany, which added economic pressure and made it hard for Germany to supply its army and to feed its people. Um, all of these things together combined to be too much for Germany. Germany could not overcome the fresh supply of troops plus all of these supplies. And in a war of attrition, that's the thing that makes the difference. It also added a complication because the United States had a unique point of view about what the war was about, given that it hadn't been fighting it and was safe an ocean away. Um, the United States believed that the war was about something called self-determination, which means the right to choose your own government. Empires are not a fan of this idea because the whole point of empires is like you colonize other people and you take them over and you don't give them a choice. So Britain and France um, had empires, did not necessarily want to give them up to this principle of self-determination. However, Germany kind of found some hope in this idea because if the war was about self-determination, then Germany, the state, the big state that's full of German speaking people should be allowed to stay together. Um, and if Germany were to become a republic, which it did, 
a democracy, you know, by definition, then it would be following the spirit of self-determination. And so the idea was that the peace treaty that followed would surely not treat Germany very badly because it was doing all of the things that the American president said that he thought he wanted in a war. Um, this is not what happened. So in summary, um, check out the hunger map of Europe by 1918. People were hungry all over the place and things were getting very dire for Germany and for France. That plus the fresh troops from America, plus like the economic aid from America from the allies that wasn't going to Germany was too much. Um, and Germany asked for an armistice by 1918. An armistice is a ceasefire. It doesn't mean we surrender. It doesn't mean we take the blame for the war. It certainly doesn't mean we recognize that we lost. It just means like, hey, let's stop shooting at each other and see if we can sort out a peace. So that's how the war ended. The leaders of the German army recognized that the war couldn't be won and asked for this armistice, stop fighting. They didn't lose a big battle. They didn't lose the war in a hugely visible, obvious way. They just got worn out first. And this is really important because it left a lot of room for some really dangerous conspiracy theories to take root. The king of Germany, meanwhile, lost power. Germany becomes a republic. And that republic is tasked with accepting the terms of the peace treaty that the allies will write. So between the armistice in November 1918, the ceasefire, and the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, there are communist uprisings and nationalist uprisings in Germany that threaten its stability. Germany puts them down. Because Germany becomes a republic and puts down these communist uprisings, Germany assumes that it will be treated leniently in the peace treaty. Like, hey, we're doing our part to fight communism. Russia's communist now, you're all afraid of that. We're stopping it, so be nice to us, is kind of the idea. Germany was wrong. It was wrong for really complicated reasons that people who don't understand history very well tend to simplify and laugh at. Um, the peace treaty that ended World War I is often pointed to as the cause of World War II, and people who don't really think about it much tend to pretend like it's an obvious cause, like what a silly mistake people made. But the thing about this war is that each of the allies got roped into the war for different reasons. And each of the allies had different expectations of the peace that came from why they were in the war to begin with and what their experience of war was. And so making a peace treaty was going to be almost impossible. I mean, think about why the war started. The Archduke of Austria-Hungary got shot in Serbia and notice that we haven't talked about either of those states pretty much the entire time we've been covering World War I. So long story short, in two attempts to break the stalemate, Germany did lead to the end of the war, just not the end of the war that it wanted because Germany lost. Please pause the video here and take notes on these two attempts to break the stalemate and the end of the war, summarizing ideally, then press play so we can continue the lesson. Before we keep going, think about for yourself, who or what do you think is responsible for World War I, given what we've covered so far? Is it a state? Which one? How much of the war is their fault? Is it just that they started it? Is it the whole thing? Is it turning it into a world war? Is it keeping it going for four years? Like, what do you mean by responsible anyway? Who's responsible for how the war went, for trench foot, for the millions dead? Is it a more long-term factor that we're gonna hold responsible for the war, like militarism or alliances or imperialism or nationalism? Was it an event or an individual's decision? In terms of what the war became, trench warfare and all the horrors that went with it, how much was propaganda responsible for it? Then think about who each participating state would say caused the war. 
the thing about it is they mostly had different answers. What do you think the big three winners, France, Britain, and the United States, would want out of the treaty, given their experience of war? Pause the video here and think about it for a minute before we keep going. Then press play again so we can dig in deeper. In 1919, the big four, as they're called, met in Paris to negotiate the Treaty of Versailles, the treaty that would bring an end to war in general, or so they thought. The big four included Lloyd George, a prime minister of Britain, um, Orlando of Italy, although it's really the big three because Italy didn't really matter much, Georges Clemenceau of France, who I think was cool because he was married to an American and the others didn't know that, so when they were speaking English, they thought that he didn't understand them, but he totally did. And Woodrow Wilson of the United States. Um, these guys were responsible for trying to bring to a conclusion the giant mess that was World War I. In negotiating the treaty, they were all technically on the same side, they were on the winning side, but they didn't all want the same things and they didn't see the war the same way. And they were trying to sort out some pretty big questions, like what should happen to the German army, navy, and air force? Should Germany be allowed to keep a military force given that it kind of started a world war in their opinion? Um, on the other hand, that whole communist thing in Russia and Germany being between Russia and them was a pretty good argument for letting them keep some military. So that was a whole thorny problem. Next, how much should Germany be asked to pay for the damage that was done during the war? Um, the war caused incredible damage. Not only did it cause like a lot of money to be spent just on funding the war, but it was incredibly damaging um, in the locations that it occurred in, notably in France especially in France's industrial zone. So it was the part of France that was pretty key to the whole economy to begin with. So what should the price tag for that be? How much land should Germany lose? Germany should probably not be allowed to be a huge state. Um, that gave Germany too much power in Europe, or so thought Britain, France, and Italy, not so much Woodrow Wilson. Um, should the treaty blame Germany for the war? somebody has to take responsibility for it, right? You can't just come back to your public and say like, meh, it just kind of happened and now millions of people are dead and expect people to keep kind of going with that. What should happen to the territories lost by the empires that fell after the war, especially Germany and Austria-Hungary, those European land empires that should be, I don't know, broken up into new states? Should they be allowed to keep the territory? What should happen to Germany's colonies? How could the Allies protect themselves, both against the spread of communism from the Soviet Union, but also against the potential for Germany to rise up and start another war? After all, Germany had kind of developed a reputation for itself. And finally, most ambitiously, What's the best way to stop a war like this from ever happening again? And how do you write that into a peace treaty? So big questions. As we go through this lesson, I have two suggestions for notes, depending on kind of what your style is. Either way, for this next section, pay close attention to how each country's experience in the war affects its demands from the Treaty of Versailles because it's going to be different. And so this really is an exercise in trying to understand a big problem from multiple different perspectives. If you're a person who thinks well through charts, organizing information like that, on the slide here, you have one suggestion for a way to do it. Thinking about each state, what they wanted in the treaty, why they wanted it, and then separately, what the treaty actually included and what new problems that treaty is going to cause. It might be a good idea also to organize some information around winners and losers and some basic vocabulary. The winners were the allies. So France, Britain, the United States, Italy, which started on the other side and then switched in hopes of getting some colonies, 
got less than it wanted. Japan, which was not taken seriously as an equal by the other allies, wasn't given any real voice in the conference and resented that later. And then like kind of Russia because it started on the ally side, but then the Russian revolution happened and the Soviet Union signed a separate peace with Germany to get out of the war. And then the allies tried to intervene to stop the Russian revolution. So like now they're not getting along at all. Of these, the main negotiating parties were France, Britain and the United States. So these are the perspectives that we're gonna pay attention to. The losers were the central powers. Germany especially, whose fate was to be determined in the peace conference. Also a loser, sorry, Austria-Hungary, um, already a declining empire anyway though. Various parts of that empire declared independence just before the war was over and peace talks were going to decide whether they get to be states or not. Also the Ottoman Empire we haven't talked much about. It was technically an ally of the Central Powers, also a declining empire before this whole mess started and it dissolved after World War I. Um, its territories were either granted independence or became protectorates of the Allies, which is like a nicer modern way of saying colonies in the Middle East, from which comes a number of modern Middle Eastern conflicts. For vocabulary, the Treaty of Versailles was the peace treaty that ended World War I. Disarmament refers to countries agreeing to reduce the number of weapons they have. Um, Self-determination refers to the right of nations to rule themselves. And the 14 points refers to American President Wilson's proposal for the peace, which was geared towards promoting free trade and the ideal of self-determination, like spreading democracy around the world so we can like trade with other democracies and make money, basically. It was deemed way too idealistic by the other allies that experienced way more direct damage from the war but Germany thought it would be an awesome basis for the peace because it was really Germany's only chance to kind of get off easy. So the chart here is one suggestion for notes. If you're more of a visual person or you can think about states as different characters, perhaps summarizing in a comic, even if it's a rudimentary comic like the one that's up on the screen right now is a great way of keeping track of different perspectives with like each state is its own little person and then speech bubbles for like what it thinks and why. I'm going to put this slide up again after I go through the key points, which is coming up next in case this is how you want to take notes and you want to use it as a model. We're going to start actually by going through a basic overview of the conflicting perspectives on the war for the major parties involved which is going to show how difficult it would be to agree on a peace treaty for them. This is the information that you need to have in your notes, but I'd actually like for you to listen to it first and then summarize. Please don't write down all of this. Um, keywords are great. And again, like personifying each state and giving them little speech bubbles is a wonderful way of making this um, really succinct. So I'll go through it with you real quick. First, all of the Allies had different goals and incentives for what they wanted out of the treaty that ended World War I. And this set the stage for a peace settlement that would be problematic or unsatisfactory to pretty much everybody involved for different reasons. Germany was not an ally, it was the loser. And Germany's perspective, you know, favored Germany, right? For Germany, World War I was a war of attrition. The Allies won by wearing out Germany's capacity to wage war, not by winning a decisive battle or by conquering Germany, which was how traditional wars tended to end. As a result, the legitimacy of any end of war agreement would be contentious with the Germans because it wasn't clear to many Germans that their country had in fact lost the war. This was true for a couple reasons. One, German propaganda told people at home that they were basically winning up until the day that they lost. So for many people on the home front, this concept that Germany lost the war was either a surprise or something that they didn't fully believe and it wasn't anything that they could see because there were no like obvious big victories. Um, this meant that one, the German public was not likely to accept a peace treaty that claimed that Germany lost the war. 
And two, it left open the door for a lot of conspiracy theories about like why Germany may be lost, including the untrue but tragically influential idea that it had been stabbed in the back by enemies back home, including communists and Jews. More on that later when we get to the Nazi part of the story. Second, towards the end of World War I, Germany agreed to negotiate a peace treaty on the basis of President Wilson's 14 points, which Germany thought would be the basis for the end of war negotiations, and it was not. So they surrendered thinking that they'd be in for a peace based on this idea of self-determination, and instead they got a very, very, very different peace treaty in the Treaty of Versailles. So that's the German story. Britain and France had a different perspective because they fought the war the whole four years um, and they paid for it in blood and in money and in damage. So Britain and France wanted compensation for war damages and sought to weaken Germany to prevent another war. Specific to Britain, Britain sought reparations to cover the costs of war, which were lower than France's, but still and to gain colonies and protectorates from the defeated powers, and also to weaken Germany's navy. So those were British interests. France experienced the most firsthand damage in terms of casualties, damage to industry, because the war was mostly in France. And so France sought reparations like money and measures to ensure that Germany, which is right next to France, could never start another war like that ever again. The United States had a very different perspective, very like distant and rose colored and, you know, from the position of safety kind of perspective. It entered the war in 1917, so three years late, and experienced comparatively few casualties and no actual war on the homeland. President Wilson pressed for an idealistic peace then based on his 14 points. Most of his ideas were rejected, but two important elements of his 14 points were put into place. The first was self-determination. Many new states were created in Eastern Europe. The second was his idea of a League of Nations to keep the peace after war. This League of Nations was created, but it was weak and it was ineffective because the United States itself, which was the only power that made it out of the war in a position to enforce its rules, refused to join. Very cute, right? Like, I'm going to propose this club. I'm not going to join, though. And I'm also the only party involved that actually made money out of the war and still has a military to speak of after it. Anyway, um, there's that. Then Italy and Japan, again, they wanted more out of the peace than they got, and they weren't very taken, they weren't taken very seriously as an equal power by the other allies, and they were both kind of salty about it. So you can Pause the slide here and take notes from the text, or pause the slide here and take notes from my little country bubbles. <laughs> 